Good morning, everyone. So today we're going to finish up <coughs> Unit 6 on optimization. You know, we just have a couple topics to cover, not very much left. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about yet is what to do when there are constraints on the design variables. So um, <coughs> we're going to see an example of this in Unit 7, so it's good to talk about it a little bit. Won't get into too much depth, but just have you be aware of um, the general procedure. So there's two kinds of constraints that are typically seen. One is uh, equality constraints, and the other is inequality constraints. <clears throat> so when you have equality constraints, that means that some function, or yeah, let's say some function of the parameters w equals zero. So this is a, a generic way of, of writing any constraint because, for example, if you wanted some constraint to be non-zero, then you can just subtract whatever value that is from the function and define a new function, and now that new one is going to be equal to zero. So let me just give you an example maybe of, of what this would look like. So in two dimensions, maybe I have some cost contours, but what I want to do is I want to constrain my parameters. In this case, we're talking about W1 and W2. I want to constrain them to this line. And so I would be looking for, actually, I didn't draw it very well. Um, let me try to draw a more interesting picture. Okay. So let's, let's put the... Let's put the, the line over here. So we have W1, W2, and, um, and if we were doing unconstrained optimization, then the minimum would be here, the place where the contours are smallest. But in constrained optimization, we're asking where's the minimum along this line, and that would be somewhere along here, right? That would be the, where the contours are smallest. So that's just an illustration of what you have for equality constraints. And so this, you could express this condition on W1, W2 that keeps on a line. You could express that this way for some function HL. Now, in general, you can have as many of these as you want. So you might have several of these equality constraints. Here we have capital L of them. <coughs> and then we can also have inequality constraints where it's quite similar, except we're going to rewrite it less than or equal to zero. And again, um, <coughs> these constraints, you know, for any number here, I could redefine my function so that that number is zero. And if I wanted greater than or equal to, then I could redefine my function as a, with a negative assign change, and then I could change the inequality. So th these are kind of generic ways of writing quality and inequality constraints. So if we were talking about inequality constraints with the above picture, we would be talking about maybe restricting w and w, W1 and W2 to this half space here. And in that case, you can see that the minimum would still be in the same place, right along that line. Um, so does that make sense, what we're talking about? OK. So the main way to handle <coughs> such problems, so again, the, the to, the optimization problem would now be find the W, the minimizer, of some cost J of W such that you have these quality constraints and inequality constraints. And the main way that we do this is we write it as an unconstrained problem involving additional design variables. <clears throat> so let's first consider the case of quality constraints. So in this case, what we would do is that we would have a new cost function. We'll call it script L like this. And it's going to involve our old parameters W, but it's also going to involve some new parameters, which I'm going to call lambda, a vector of parameters lambda. And the new cost is the old one, J. But now we're going to add this extra term here <coughs> called the Lagrangian that has here are the new optimization variables, and here are the 
constraint functions. And, uh, and now when we do this optimization, the optimization is jointly over W and lambda together. So <clears throat> why does this work? <clears throat> well, as we know, um, okay, so notice, number one, this is an unconstrained problem. There's no more constraints on W or lambda. And so in this unconstrained problem, we know that the minimum <clears throat> must occur at a location with uh, zero derivatives with respect to the lambdas and with respect to the w's. But let's focus on what happens when we have a derivative with respect to lambda l equals zero. So if I take the derivative of this with respect to lambda l, I'm just going to get hl w, right? And if I set that equal to zero, that's exactly what I want to do here. So by adding this extra term with these new variables and thinking the problem is unconstrained, we automatically satisfy our constraint functions here as well as optimize over W that satisfies the constraint and minimizes this, this cost. So it does everything together. And uh, so we'll see an example of this in the next unit. But that's, that's the main idea. Um, is that making sense? Yeah. Is that similar to lasso regression? No, it's, it's not. So in lasso, the main difference is this is an L1 norm. Um, here, this is not going to be a norm. This is just going to be some function that satisfies your constraint. <clears throat> I mean, yes, we, I can't remember. We may have used, no, I don't think we used lambda and lasso. But it's, it's not really, people don't really think of these as regularizations. Um, these terms are not, not going to be positive for general W like a regularization would. It serves a bit of a different role. Yeah. I, I don't think of it as a penalty um, because, like I said, it's, it's a penalty you, you typically want to have as a positive thing that pushes you away. And the main difference is that we actually have these new optimization variables here. So if this is really a penalty function, we wouldn't have these new variables. Right? This would be you would have W and W. Um, with, with respect to lambda? Uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, I guess, I, I think maybe in the, hmm, um, I, I don't know if that's, let's see, because At the optimal solution, this whole term will, will go away, right? So, um... Actually, it depends. It's, if it's a complex function, then, yeah, the, dual and the duality gap would be zero. But if it's not uh, complex, so it's not... Uh, I mean, we would not have to... Uh, like to yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I, I basically... Um, for now, we're, we're not really going to get into all these details in this course. So, yeah, if, if I would say, like, to understand all these things more deeply, um, definitely would be good to take a convex optimization course or an optimization course. So right now, the, the main idea is that we have new variables. When we set the gradient to zero, we recover this, and that's how we, we think about our problems. <clears throat> when we have inequality constraints, um, the situation is similar in that we have, so this is, this is in the case with both. So here we have the same term as before, and then we have this 
final term, which covers the inequality constraints. Um, what's a little bit different with the inequality constraints is they can be active or inactive. So here is a, an example where when I, I have this inequality constraint, and when I solved the problem, I found out that the inequality constraint was enforced. Um, but I could have another problem where, let me try to modify this a little bit. I could have another problem where I put an inequality constraint here. And now when I'm solving this problem, the solution is here, and this inequality constraint is not active, uh, right? Like a, if I didn't have the inequality constraint, I would be getting the same solution. So that's an additional um, complication with these inequality constraints. And there's some additional um, things we have to think about when solving these problems. But we still do have this term here. We have additional variables that we set the gradient to 0. And it's just that there's a few extra complications to, to consider when solving this problem. So I don't want to get into more details than this. Just, just a very, very uh, introductory look at how you might attack these constrained problems. And um, like I said, we're going to see one example of this in the next unit. And so this is just trying to give us a little bit of intuition as to uh, when, we, when we see that sort of term, like where that's coming from. That bottom line has both an equality and an inequality trait? Exactly, yeah. Right. <clears throat> okay, so just wanted you to be a little bit familiar with this, but definitely we're not getting into any details here. <clears throat> okay, and then the very last topic, which we'll also cover quite briefly, is convexity. So, first of all, why do we care about convexity? So we care about convexity because we saw earlier that if you have a convex function and you find a local minimizer of that function, then you can be assured that that local minimizer is a global minimizer. And you don't have to worry about whether you found a bad local minimizer or a good one. You can be confident that you found a good one. So, um, so now it's time to talk about, okay, what is this? What do we mean by convex? Um, so here are a couple illustrations of convex function and a non-convex function. And here, at least in the pictures, you can quite clearly see that there's a couple uh, different minima here. There's a global minima and um, local minima, whereas this convex function here has only one global minimum. OK, so how do we? How do we recognize or define convexity in functions? So the first thing we have to talk about before we even talk about the functions, we have to talk about convex sets. So first, OK, we, let's say we have a set. We'll call the set D. The set D is convex if we can say in words, the line between any two points in the set remains in that set. Um, so let's say we, we define these two points as x and y. And then we define the line segment between them as follows. We take some number between 0 and 1. And then we do this. This is called a convex combination. You can kind of think about it like a weighted average between those two points. And you can see that this quantity here will be somewhere along the line between x and y. So if, if this point here is, remains within the set for all t, then you have a convex set. So on the top right, we have a convex set because no matter where I pick those two points and I draw the line between them, you can see it's always going to be in the set. But on the bottom, we have a non-convex set where we have two points here that I found where I can draw a line between them, and points on that line actually go outside the set. So the bottom would be a non-convex set, top convex set. 
So um, <coughs> examples of these convex sets would be circles are obviously convex. If you just imagine this, this is almost like a circle. Squares work the same way. Ellipses work the same way. If you have an n-dimensional parameter space and you look at the entire space, uh, real, the reals in n-dimension, that's a convex set. If you look at a hyperplane within that space, that's a convex set. And if you look at any half space, so <coughs> of, of Rn, and, and one way to write that is like this. That would be like if you have Rn and, and you take any kind of uh, <coughs> line through it and you look at what happens on one side of that line, this is a way of doing it. Um, you find that that's also a convex set. So these are just all examples of convex sets. Okay, is this convex set idea making sense? All right, so now let's talk about convex functions. So a function, f, this is a function that returns a real number. This is convex if number one, its domain is a convex set, and number two, Okay, to say this in words, if you look at a convex combination of the input to the function and then apply the function, this is less than or equal to a convex combination of the output of the function. So the picture on the right illustrates this. So here's our point x, here's our point y, and then for any number t between 0 and 1, I would if I look at a convex combination of those two input points, I'm somewhere along this line segment down here. So this would be exa one example of a point. Here's my function, the this curved thing. And now if I look at a convex combination of the outputs, so here's the output fx here. Up here is the output fy. And then if I do a convex combination of those values, fx and fy, I can get <coughs> things like this. Right? And, the, and, and that, if I trace that out, that gives me this line. So a convex function is one that for all x and y, and for all you know, locations between those x and y, this function lies, it never lies above this line. So again, convex combination of the inputs to the function is less than or equal to a convex combination of those two outputs of the function. So, so this is the idea of convexity expressed uh, visually. So you know, if you can imagine if, if this function has a bump like this, then you can find two points where this relationship fails. So you never, you always have to have, um, yeah, you, you can never find a place where, where this behavior uh, fails. And so this is a, the notion of convexity. So you, you could have a situation like this. And I'm showing you this because this is one example where you have actually many global minima. Right? All these points are equally good. Um, and so all local minima are global minima. It doesn't mean that there's a unique uh, global minima, that you can have more than one, but they're all equally good. Okay, so this is the notion of convexity. And this is what we hope to have in a function when we minimize it, because then we can rest assured that we can use uh, a procedure, a uh, straightforward optimization procedure and, and solve the problem and not have to worry about whether we have solved the problem or not. Okay, any questions on convexity? All right, so here's a few examples of convex functions. So this is a, any linear function, or you could say affine linear, because there's a scaling of x and then a shift. Any linear function of this form is uh, convex. <coughs> 
we can extend x to multiple values, and then the same function would look like this. Here we have a linear combination of the different elements in x plus the shift. This is exactly what we saw for linear regression and also for logistic regression. This is the function that gave us the score z. Then um, we have quadratic functions of this form. This is a scalar quadratic. So this is convex if and only if this term that's scaling the, the square term is greater or equal to 0. Because what happens is, okay, so if a equals 0, you can see then we're just back to the linear case. But if a is negative, then we get a function that's upside down, and now this fails this rule over here. So we need that upward curvature for convexity to hold. So that's why we have this constraint here. <clears throat> and um, let me just skip ahead to this one. This is a little bit related. So if you have a generic function, it may not be quadratic, but you can compute the second derivative everywhere. And the second derivative is non-negative everywhere, then that function is convex. So it's sort of like a conceptually similar to here, but you know, more, more capable statement. All you have to do is be able to compute that second derivative and have it be positive. Okay, and then if you look at what happens in the vector case, where you have a vector of x, then rather than the second derivative, you have to compute the Hessian matrix, which is a matrix of all the different individual second derivatives. And then that Hessian matrix must exist everywhere and be positive semi-definite. Um, so positive semi-definite means We'll call this the Hessian matrix. We'll talk about this um, a little bit later in the course, but if you have a matrix H and you take an arbitrary vector C and you multiply on the left by C transpose on the right by C, this reduces it to a scalar. If this scalar is greater or equal to zero for all C, then this is what it means for that matrix to be positive definite. It's a generalization of this greater or equal to zero, but uh, up to matrices. So when these Hessians exist and are positive semi-definite, then the vector value function is convex. <clears throat> okay, and uh, other examples of convex functions, norms, are always going to be convex, whether it's the Euclidean norm or the one norm or any other norm. And interestingly, once, once you have all these building blocks, if you have two convex functions and you add them, the resulting function is convex. And if you compose them, the function is convex. So what's interesting about that is remember that we had like for our, our linear methods like linear regression and logistic regression, we had this sort of as the first stage of the function. And then the second stage of the function <coughs> did something with the outputs of this. Like maybe it put it into a two norm squared, or maybe it put it into logistic function. Well, that's an example of, um, of this composition. And for that reason, all the things we've seen so far in the course, like RSS, logistic loss, or when we add the L1 or L2 regularization, all those problems there, they're all convex. And so the convex methods that we've talked about, or the, the optimization, gradient-based optimization methods that we've talked about in this unit, um, <clears throat> we can all be assured that they were gonna, they're going to solve these problems, and um, we don't have to worry about encountering local minima and things like that. So that's all I had to say about um, convexity. <clears throat> just again, just to, because sometimes we, we talk about convex functions and we distinguish convex and non-convex and so there's just a little bit about why we care about them and what they are. 
Okay, any questions on anything here? All right. So then just finally, um, <coughs> a few comments and other topics. So one comment is that uh, <coughs> we had, we talked about this armijo based optimizer. We also talked about line search methods where you're trying to uh, adapt that, that learning rate or step size on the fly. Just a comment is that this stuff works well for convex functions, but it doesn't work so well for non-convex functions. And so um, I don't want to give you the impression that this is, these techniques are always what you want to use. But for convex functions, they tend to work well. Now, there's all these things that we didn't cover <coughs> just uh, because you know, we have too many other things to discuss. Um, one extension of our gradient-based methods are to methods that not only look at the gradient, the, the slope of the function, but they look at the curvature of the function. And these methods are known as Newton's method and quasi-Newton's method. One way to think about them is that the step size or learning rate becomes a matrix. And when that becomes a matrix, it can be a lot more capable. And rather than when you have a, um, when you have a very stretched out function like this, what gradient descent does is it converges quickly along the steep side and then very slowly along the shallow slide. Whereas what Newton's method does is if this is a quadratic surface, it's smart enough to take in the curvature and it will converge in one step to the solution. Now, the Newton's method update is more complex. It has a matrix inverse of the Hessian and so on. So it's, um, so it's more expensive per, per step than a gradient method. But in some cases, it's worthwhile to have that extra complexity. And then sometimes when you can't um, solve for or invert this full Hessian people approximate it, they call it quasi-Newton methods, and sometimes those methods are sort of like in between linear and Newton's method. So that's one branch of things we didn't talk about, but it's, it's something that sometimes you see. Another big uh, branch of methods that are important are methods where the loss is not smooth enough such that that gradient exists everywhere. So if the gradient doesn't exist everywhere, we can't assume we can compute it. And um, one example of that problem is like any time you add an L1 loss, that L1 loss is sort of like this in each dimension and there's no gradient down here um, at the origin. So in that case, we can't use these gradient-based methods and we have to uh, apply some other methods from non-smooth optimization. And that's a whole uh, field of study that we won't get into. Um, so if you want to learn more about this, we have some great optimization courses here. There's the more introductory one. It's offered every autumn. It's 57, 59. Highly recommend that. And then we have a couple of other ones. So one of them is uh, this convex optimization course taught every two years. And then actually this semester, we started um, a new course. I'm trying to remember. It has a temporary number right now. I, I think... I, I don't know if this is right. It might be 8101. And it's basically optimization for machine learning. And what it has is it has a lot of advanced methods on non-convex optimization and maybe non-smooth optimization. And it will get a permanent number um, maybe the next time we offer it. But right now it has, it's under this course, which is, Sounds strange, but it's, it's like, uh, I think it's called um, Special Topics in Networking. So anyway, um, we do have some optimization courses. If you're interested in this material, you can learn more about it. All right. Um, any other questions on convex optimization or optimization? OK, great. So, so that concludes this unit.